There's probably a lot of times where you thought to yourself, wow, I didn't know that rule existed in the NFL. Well, here's some more for you. What is going on guys? While the NFL has this perception that it is nothing more than a brutish and sort of modern gladiator league, there's actually a surprising amount of nuance and strategy that goes into playing the game. Not just from a strategy perspective, but also staying within the confines of its intricate and extensive rulebook. Let's take a look at the NFL's most obscure rules that I bet you didn't even know existed. Palpably unfair act. First up we have what the NFL defines as a palpably unfair act. Sounds a lot like Palpatine. Do it. Everyone take out your copy of the NFL rulebook and turn to Rule 12, Section 3, Article 3, which reads, A player or substitute shall not interfere with play by any act which is palpably unfair. And if you flip ahead a few pages to Rule 13, Section 1, Article 7, you'll find the same rule for coaches, which says a non-player shall not commit an act which is palpably unfair. To put it in layman's terms, the NFL has effectively put in an umbrella rule that allows referees to use their discretion regarding any strategy that a player or coach might use to take advantage of a loophole in the rules. So say for example, there was a player breaking down the sideline into the open field with a sure touchdown in sight. This rule discourages a player or coach on the opposing sideline from interfering with the play. Because without this rule, they could just go rogue and eat the penalty to keep the other team from scoring. When a palpably unfair act is committed, officials are free to award the yardage a player would have reasonably gained, including a touchdown, if applicable. They also return the lost time in the clock and have the option to eject the individual responsible. Think Ravens Steelers 2013, when Mike Tomlin appeared to prevent Jacoby Jones from scoring on a third quarter kickoff. Shockingly, Tomlin wasn't penalized for a palpably unfair act on this play, but he sure as hell could have been. Oh, and remember when Ravens quarterback Joe Flacco was telling his teammates on the sideline to tackle Ted Ginn if he breaks loose near the end of Super Bowl 47. Yeah, uh, sorry Joe. According to the NFL rulebook, telling your teammates to run onto the field and prevent a would-be touchdown won't prevent the refs from awarding a touchdown, and it could even get you ejected. That's not how you want to go out in the big game. Drop kick. Some of our older fans may remember this rule from 2006, when then-Patriots backup quarterback Doug Flutie converted the NFL's first successful drop kick since 1941, long before the Super Bowl was even coined as the name for the league title game. According to the Pro Football Hall of Fame website, the league's last drop kick for points was on December 21st, 1941, when Ray Scooter McLean converted for the Chicago Bears to beat the New York Giants 37-9 in the NFL Championship game. The rule stems from the game's early ties to rugby and it was a much more popular play during the early iterations of football when the ball was more round which allowed for a more predictable bounce and even to this day the play remains a fixture in the league's rulebook even though it really has no competitive merits and is effectively just a riskier version of a place kick I mean, I can't really tell the NFL how to run its business, but why even bother having it in the rulebook? Especially if it's going to be worth the same as a regular kick, but like 10 times harder. Like, come on. <laughs> Unless you're Bill Belichick trying to rub it in. Who in their right mind is going to attempt a drop kick in a competitive game? I say we double up the value of any drop kick and watch NFL teams sputter out trying to get their place kickers up to speed up on the aging technique. That's just my two cents, but you know, I'm just saying it'll be fun, be different. It's the same thing every year. Like, come on, make it like more fun, make it exciting. Illegal leverage. Despite what any of you day trading friends out there might think, this rule has absolutely nothing to do with stocks, regardless of the fact that it sounds more like an SEC regulation than an NFL rule. The illegal leverage rule instead states that while the offensive team attempts to kick a field goal or extra point conversion, the defensive team may not push or pull members of their own team to gain that extra momentum or height to block the field goal. Any team that violates this rule is slapped with a 15-yard unsportsmanlike penalty, and the kicking team gets an automatic first down. So it is a pretty serious infraction to have after doing well to hold the opposition to a field goal attempt. Unsurprisingly, the Patriots found themselves on the wrong side of this rule in 2013, in overtime during a game against the New York Jets. Those guys just, uh, love stretching the boundaries of the rules, if you will. Yeah. Leaping over the line. The changes to the rules around this play, which I must admit was a rather exciting one, came back in 2017 after, you guessed it, the Patriots popularized a strategy in which they send one of their most athletic pass rushers to leap over the long snapper who was bent over to deliver the snap. While Patriots fans might like to think that this was just another instance of the league being out to get their team, the push actually came from the NFLPA's president at the time, offensive lineman Eric Winston. The jumping over on the field goal 
well, I think it's just leading to a really dangerous play for everybody. Winston said via the Washington Post. And I mean, I guess he sort of has a point. The snapper is in a pretty vulnerable position, but even so, I do miss watching that play happen. It is just so hard to get a hand on the field goal otherwise. And it was awesome watching such a freakish feat of athleticism on display. At least we'll always have the highlights of yesteryear to remember it by. Back to back timeouts. Although the play is allowed in the college game, in the NFL, a team is allowed to call only one timeout per dead ball period. NFL jargon aside, that means a coach can't call two timeouts in between the same two plays. Considering the rarity in which this play would ever really be executed, as teams value their timeouts like gold. The league's rulebook is actually fairly explicit on this judgment. Each team may be granted a charged team timeout during the same dead ball period, but a second charged team timeout by either team during the same dead ball period is prohibited. Follow a referee's timeout or any automatic timeouts. You may not know this rule because it's only been broken out once in the modern game. Back in 2006, during a game between Buffalo and Washington. Washington's head coach, Joe Gibbs, called a timeout just before Bills kicker Ryan Lindell attempted a 51-yard field goal. The kick was good, but Gibbs had already been awarded the timeout by the official. Unfortunately for Gibbs, he jumped the shark on his strategic timeout calls by requesting his second one when Lindell was preparing to kick the ball again. Gibbs was issued an unsportsmanlike conduct penalty, which narrowed the attempt from 51 yards to 36 yards out. Lindell made the 36-yard field goal to win the game for the Bills, 18-17. It's a, it's a tough look for a season veteran of the league, if you ask me. One point safety. The safety is one of the most iconic plays in all of football. There's just something about it. The dramatic swing of momentum, the hilarious signal the officials make. But beyond the traditional safety call, there is actually a whole other play that gets very little shine. And most NFL fans, even the diehard ones, don't know about it. The one point safety. Although the play is beyond rare, it is a possibility. The rule works in the same way that the two point touchdown exists as a possibility for a defending team on a two point conversion attempt. Just the one point safety is a whole lot more hilarious. It, it really is. For it to take place, a team would need to be on the field for an extra point attempt and botch the snap. And the ensuing play would have to go so badly, so badly, that they ended up all the way back in their own end zone when they would get tackled by the opposing defense. In that case, because the play took place during an extra point attempt, only one point would be awarded to the defending team. Of course, it also could have been awarded if the offensive team fumbled the ball into the defensive team's end zone. And then the defense illegally batted the ball out of bounds, giving the offense a one point safety. The chances of it ever happening in a game are sadly slim to none, but man, would it be a sight to see. Possession after scores. Now, if you thought that there was a minuscule chance that the one point safety was gonna take place, hold the phone. Because the possession after a score rule will almost surely never rear its head in an NFL game again. The rule like the drop kick dates back to a prehistoric version of gridiron football. When after a score, the team captains would meet in the middle of the field and the team that had gotten scored on would elect whether they wanted to kick or receive the ensuing kickoff. I can't really put myself in the mind space of 1930s football coaches, but it's hard to imagine that kicking the ball away after getting scored on was ever a great strategy. Really, just why would you do that? Probably why they got rid of that. Although some of those Bears teams we've seen over the past few years maybe should have given it a chance. Just saying, give it a shot. Better than letting that offense take the field again. Yeah. Fair catch kick. The fair catch kick rule is another old school strategy, except this one actually does have some merit in the modern game. Admittedly, a rather minuscule amount of merit, but merit nonetheless. The rule works like this. After a fair catch, the team that was receiving the kick or punt has the option to put the ball in play via a fair kick catch, which is a unique spin on the traditional field goal attempt, as the defense has to line up 10 yards off the ball, similar to a kickoff, and they are not permitted to even try and block the kick. In many ways, the free kick is more like a kickoff, except the kicker has to attempt a field goal off the ground and there's also a holder. Other than that, all the general rules apply as they would with really any other field goal attempt from scrimmage. The Panthers made a pretty epic attempt at implementing a strategy around this rule back in 2019 when they were playing the Buccaneers. The only thing is, it really only makes sense for a team to try it towards the end of the half because while the free run at a kick is great, that's pretty much the only situation in which it's worth it to forego the allotted downs. Sadly for Carolina, the kick ended up sailing wide right, but I could definitely see another team attempting it again when the situation calls for it. Ball between the QB's legs. To be honest, this rule is completely nonsensical. So much so that when we saw it take place back in 07 during a game between Philadelphia and Chicago, an NFL officiating supervisor admitted that he didn't even know what the intent of the rule was when the stripes received criticism for making the call. The rule mandates that if the ball is snapped in between the quarterback's legs, he has to be the one to recover the ball. Unlike a bot shotgun snap that traditionally might sail over the QB's head, in this instance, the defense can't even recover the football until the QB touches 
watches it first. During the Philly-Chicago game, Chicago quarterback Brian Greasy had a snap go through his legs untouched. The ball rolled behind the quarterback and was picked up by Eagle safety Sean Considine, whose return put his team in position for a go-ahead touchdown. Until it didn't. That's because the ball between the QB's legs rule came into play, overturning the Eagles' turnover. I can only imagine how it was not a very happy day in Philadelphia after seeing that strange rule play out. What crazy NFL rule intrigues you the most? Join me in the comment section below. Make sure to follow myself and TPS on social media. We post great content all the time. Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, YouTube, we're on everything. Go find us, go subscribe, go do the whole thing. If you like this video, give it a like. It takes one click down below and subscribe to TPS. We post videos every single day. Every day is a new video. Subscribe to TPS. It's a good idea. You should do it. There is so much cool, fun, and important educational things you're going to learn. Yeah, that was smooth. Of course, thank you so much for watching. I'm Jason Biondo. I'll see you next time. Oh,